I was very much interested in how the disciplines should speak to each other. And this is, I think, the influence that Chicago had on me. Here, the Chicago had the uh, Committee on Social Thought, which is a fascinating creature in the university, drawing some of the finest minds of the university, including Nobel laureates, together because they wanted to talk to each other across their disciplines, across their schools, thinking that in so doing they would fructify each, one, e each other's uh, imaginations and thought. Uh, they weren't attempt, this was not a matter of imperialism on one discipline or another, but really the intellectual ferment that should mark a great university was there in spades. I wanted to recreate that at Emory. Law, or the, at, at that time, theology and law provided one instance of this which came to, um, to hand with uh, the presence of Frank Alexander who had done a, this, this double degree at Harvard and his interest in Hal Berman. And so in a way, it was uh, opportunistic on my part to want to uh, see that happen here at Emory. Initially, uh, this all was made possible because we had an infusion of, uh, of capital funds with the Woodruff gift, which at that time uh, broke records in terms of its size, but also for Emory, almost doubled our endowment overnight. And since there were no restrictions on it, we were able to be innovative. I wanted to set them in motion to cross the disciplines and indeed the, the, the professions in a way that would, would enable these conversations to take place and new thought to emerge. And law and religion has done this marvelously uh, beyond anything that I could have expected or I think anyone on campus with the possible exception of Hal Berman. Frank Alexander and John Whitty. I mean, they may have had this in mind, but, <laughs> but you know, my role as president was to, to plant a seed and provide some, uh, some resources. And I, there's no way I knew how it would uh, actually grow. Some things didn't grow as well. Some things just bloomed be beautifully, and this is one of them. Uh, but it was out of the commitment and, and indeed the, the deep conviction that uh, the, the university not only should be a collection of disciplines and professions, but it should be a, uh, a scene of, of uh, fertile uh, intellectual conversation and that we should not be afraid to look at the more intractable problems of life either community or society, simply because our disciplines were not uh, designed to encompass them. And uh, I, I can say this over and over again. The idea is not to qualify or uh, negatively impact the disciplines, but to broaden them. I've known Frank Alexander since he was really a senior in college um, and was quite taken with him and his interest which uh, intersected in many ways with mine and namely in terms of, of the passion for religion, for commitment, for values, for a sense of meaning of life uh, along with his uh, marvelous sense of uh, discipline in terms of the law itself its practice and its potential, and his determination to see that the law did good in society, not just uh, as a vehicle to be exploited for aggrandizement, but actually as a promotion of the larger public good. That drew me to Frank very early on in his life, and uh, the fact that he came to Emory and began working on this was, I think, an expression uh, vehicle for that, those concerns which I shared. Um, people may think that I had uh, less 
commitment to the law school or less interest in it. I didn't. I did have a vision of the law as handmaiden of a better social uh, order of, of, a, of a good society and of serving the public good. Uh, the law is the repository not only of the rules and uh, sanctions of, of life, but also of uh, pointing to how we should live together in a way that is truly civil and redounds to the good of, of us all and allows room for freedom of expression, but also uh, sets limits in terms of rapaciousness of human nature. Being a theologian, I, I'm often uh, want to quote the fact that the only uh, Christian doctrine that is empirically verifiable is original sin. <laughs> and uh, law is, is a very important <laughs> assistance in that. Uh, but that was the, the, the way it went. Frank and I got together, and I, I admired his passion and his commitment to that larger social good, which embodied both religion and law. Um, Hal Berman uh, came and brought a, uh, a great historical perspective on this, showing, in a way, uh, establishing the legitimacy within the legal um, order, within the faculties, of the role of religion and law, and was able to um, uh, interpret it in a way that won enormous support across the university and across the, the nation and the world, as he worked in Russia and other places. And then John Whitty came with his uh, uh, laser mind and uh, historical grasp, a student and colleague of, uh, of Hal as well, and uh, with that kind of focused dedication has uh, nurtured and brought into being the, uh, the center in ways that could uh, address major issues like the family and uh, society and uh, marriage and so forth, uh, law and religion with, uh, with application and uh, reflection upon these things. So um, I see here a triumvirate of, uh, of, of, of remarkable uh, professors who's, uh, who complement one another in, a, in an amazing way. It's, it's really quite fortuitous that we could have three people who, whose um, interest and capacities and commitments could so uh, mesh and yet complement each and bring strengths that, that added to the whole. The long-range purpose of any program that law and religion uh, would mount uh, is not only to illuminate and explicate the, the problem at hand, whether it's uh, some social dimension of life that, that, need, you know, that uh, uh, makes itself accessible, uh, marriage uh, and the whole issue of uh, of the gay, the gay role, the, the issue of children and, and society. Uh, the, the, their whole range of things that, that, that are now both controversial and uh, important uh, for our public discourse. Uh, these things can be illuminated, as I say, and reflected upon uh, by scholars. Uh, but the idea of the illumination and the reflection, I think, is to educate the larger public and what the issues are so that it could be more informed uh, decision making uh, and not just out of um, inherited uh, opinion or even prejudice. Um, I'm not one to think that uh, all of our values are amenable to rational discussion. They don't dissolve under rational examination. But I do think that the role of the university is to, uh, in many ways, not only uh, analyze, uh, but also in some instances to uh, unmask the hidden assumptions and uh, uh, 
accepted wisdom of the past, uh, not in the, not necessarily in a harsh, uh, acidic light, but in a in one that that helps us to better understand what actually is going on. And I think out of that illumination, then the role of the university is not then to become a political instrument, but it is to educate the public. That's what we do, and not simply accept the prevailing wisdom of the public. Now, that doesn't mean that we're necessarily an elite that knows the best, but if we find things to be true and believe them to be true, then I think it's our uh, responsibility to help educate others to that uh, discovery. The role and importance of religion in uh, in the academy uh, has has emerged as a major uh, concern. I think as we see uh, the extremists on all sides, uh, both in the Middle East and around the world, and in all religions, um, you know, at the worst, resort to violence in terms of the pursuit of their aims and the intractability of many of the positions that uh, that some of the religions hold. And I think in a way, I, won't, I can't at all say that this is an outgrowth of the academy's uh, neglect of religion and religious issues. But 30 or 40 years ago, uh, you couldn't get any department of political science in the country, if not the world, to include the importance of religion in a consideration of foreign policy. Today, looking back on that, that seems inexcusably naive and short-sighted. Um, part of what we're saying is that while there's an, an understandable uh, I don't want to say reluctance, but uneasiness with having religious convictions come in to a discussion of rational concerns. The reality of those who are motivated by religious conviction remains, and we have to deal with that. Um, I think part of what's happened in the last few decades is we've learned that the, uh, the conceit that we, we're dealing with rational man is uh, is one that needs to be discarded. Uh, how we deal with that uh, imaginatively and creatively and successfully is is something we continue to work with. But we can no longer dismiss the issue of religious motivation among the billions of people in the world. And uh, I think this means that the, a place for law and religion is all the more prominent because of the importance of that dialogue, that discussion, and the inclusion of considerations that uh, emerge out of the religious dimension of life. It doesn't mean that one is co-opted by religion. It means that you take the empirical uh, importance and influence of religion seriously. It cannot be dismissed. So in that sense, I would say that law and religion was uh, prophetic. I mean, the fact that it, it was dealing with these issues long before they became generally acceptable or uh, even considered important uh, is a tribute to the, the leaders of this program, and uh, I salute them for their, uh, for their uh, visionary uh, uh, attempt to to bring this off, which I think has just been beyond anything I could have imagined. We're going to need to see the issue of international law and the role of, of religion and religious extremism dealt with, and that might be something beyond the domestic scene and even the uh, the national scene that, that tends to preoccupy us now. Um, how this would fit into an issue of, of uh, 
international understanding, foreign policy. But after all, one of the things that I did early on in my presidency was appoint uh, former President Jimmy Carter to the faculty and work with him in his Carter Center. And one of the main reasons was because he was committed to human rights, which at that time was still considered to be somewhat naive by the realists, the pragmatists of uh, the foreign policy establishment. Now, of course, you have uh, even the neoconservatives uh, beating the, uh, their, their putative enemies over the head with their uh, uh, abuse of, of human rights. So <laughs> this pendulum swings. When one looks at the, uh, at the modern world and the uh, way in which the religions are now impacting one another, some of them you know, driving their national foreign policy and so forth, you can see how uh, the issue of law and religion uh, uh, plays in a, in a more international uh, uh, setting. Um, I think that the, uh, the role of, of uh, understanding other religions is going to be more and more important, obviously, and I commend uh, President Wagner and his new emphasis on campus in interreligious dialogue, um, not in a kind of facile sense in which you just get people together and chat, but serious discussion of, of the way in which uh, the various faiths uh, shape one's outlook on life and one's perspective, one's values. And finally, one's uh, view of human nature and, uh, and, and the destiny of, of humankind. Um, I think the religions of Asia are, are kind of only now coming into their own, uh, Hinduism and Buddhism in particular. Uh, Islam has become so prominent because of the Middle East and the uh, issues we have now with terrorism and so forth. Uh, <coughs> but. I don't think we've even begun to touch or the, the plumb the depths of, of how much this is going to be a, a, um, a preoccupation in the future. And I think it gives the um, center, of uh, Law and Religion Center, an opportunity to um, be in the forefront of that di discussion. How it will play out, I, I wouldn't want to make uh, any kind of guess.